we won't have time to go through all of them, okay? But I'll go through the ones that I think we need to just have a, a look at, okay? So please stop me if you have any questions, and then we can we can go through it in more detail if needed. Okay? So whenever we're looking at finding area, especially total area, a lot of the questions ask us to find the actual area under the graph. Like we saw that sometimes we can have a positive and a negative area, right? So whenever you are working with area under a graph, if you don't have a graph, then usually you need to draw a graph, okay? And I think some of the questions actually did. They asked you to draw the graph and then find the area, right? So we need a function, right? So usually you'll be given a function or a graph with a function, right? In this case, we were given the graph x cubed minus 8x squared plus 16x. And they asked us to find the area between 0 and 4. Okay, so where the graph was intersecting the x-axis. Okay. Um, sorry, let me just put this down here. Okay, so we can't obviously work out that area by any kind of formula that we know, so we need to use our calculus and we will take the primitive between those two values. Okay, so the first thing you had to do was anti-differentiate your function. And I'm sure you saw now with the homework, you're gonna to have to start becoming very, very careful with how you write stuff because it gets very messy, very care, very quickly, okay? Simplify as much as you can, use as many lines. Don't try and skip steps by calculating things in your head, do it step by step so that you don't make these silly mistakes. Because it's very easy to get the wrong answer just by accidentally adding something or subtracting something from it. Okay? So whenever we are looking at these, we always have to set our boundaries, okay? And the end is always the top. And the beginning is always the bottom, which means that we take the end, which is the furthest x value to the right, and we take away the start, which is the value on the left. Okay? So if you take them in the opposite order, you're going to get a negative answer, all right? And we actually, we learned that in last lesson, right? If we take the boundaries and we switch them from B to A, you will just get a negative of whatever you're going to get, all right? And I'm going to show you later on, we can actually use that to our advantage. Right, anyways, the rest of the question just required you to plug in the numbers. So you had to just be very careful. We were plugging in fours first. And then you could pretty much work out that all those other terms were just going to give you zero when you plugged in zero. Okay, so it was kind of nice. You just had to work with one fraction. So I got 21 and a third. And remember, we have to write there units squared because it's area. Okay. If we were just asked to find the integral, right, the integral doesn't really specify area, then you can leave the unit out. But we were asked to find area, so please just write unit squared. Okay. okay, the next question, right? You can physically see or visually see that the area is underneath the x-axis, right? And because area is signed, that means we're going to get a negative area down here, okay? So you should have expected to get this negative result when you anti-differentiated, right? And took the primitive function, okay? Now, because area cannot be negative, we just make it positive. We take what we call the absolute value of the amount, right? So if it's negative, it's positive. If it's positive, it stays positive, right? Absolute value just means whatever you have, just make it positive, right? Because it's a scalar quantity, it can't have a negative value, right? And when we combine areas, like we're gonna see in the next question, right, you will see that where this becomes apparent. Right? Again, guys, stop me if I'm going too fast, all right? Or if you want me to explain something in more detail. Okay, the next question asks us to basically take these two parts of this curve, section R1 and section R2, and they asked us to show that the area of these two regions is the same, okay? So what we do is we just say, well, let's compare the two, right? 
let's compare R1 and R2 and see what we get. Okay? Now it's the same function, right? So fortunately, when we took the primitive of this function, you could have just copied it from one to the next, except the big difference here is that the boundaries are different, right? Your limits are different. The one is from zero to two, and the other one is from two to four. Now, I recommend that you write this line out here because it tells me that you knew where to start and where to end, all right? That you're taking the end and you're subtracting the start. If you swap them around, you're going to get the incorrect answer, okay? So tell me, show you taking F prime at two, take away F prime at zero, and it'll also help you to put the right figures in, right? So that you don't mix the boundaries up. Right, from here, it's just arithmetic soup. So lots of number crunching to do. Just be diligent, be super careful with how you plug these things into your calculator as well, right? I would have got four on the one side for R1, and I got negative four for R2. And if you look at the graph, you can visually see that, okay? We had this positive area at the top, and a negative area at the bottom. And because integrals are signed area, it will give you a negative area below the graph, right? But we can state that since area can only be positive, the area for R2 must also be four, right? It can't be negative four, we don't have negative areas, and therefore area of R1 is equal to R2. Okay, so that's how you would have sorted this. Right, here we had, <clears throat> find the total area bound by the curve and the axis, right? And you had to draw this thing first. Now they had given it to you in factorized form, so you could very easily and quickly have just worked out the x-intercepts, right? And you would have just needed to remember that when you're working with a cubic graph, right? How does the gradient start? Well, from left to right, if the gradient is positive on a cubic graph, it's just like a straight line. It goes from bottom up, right? It has a positive gradient. So I'll just draw one off over here, positive gradient, okay? If it was a negative cubic graph, it would be like a, well, a downhill straight line. It would have started at the top and gone, I don't want that, gone downhill, okay? Something like that. So if you, need to go brush up on your cubic graphs. Any case, there we have the graph and we were asked to find the area between the curve and the x-axis. So you could see how I had this little positive area here and this big negative area at the bottom, okay? Now I wasn't found, asked to find the signed area, I was asked to find the total area. So if we are thinking about total area and we have a negative area, what we do is we take the area above the x-axis, or there could be multiple areas above the x-axis. We take all these areas above the x-axis and we subtract them from the areas below the x-axis because that subtract is going to create a double negative. When you subtract something negative, it becomes positive. And so you will automatically end up changing it into a uh, positive area, okay? There is another method that you can use, but we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. And that basically says that if we swap these limits, if we take the start and we subtract the end, it will automatically change our negative area into a positive, right? We'll do one of those in a second. Right, anyways, here we had, if I want to find this combined area, you can see that I have between negative one and zero. Here's my negative one and zero. And for the negative areas between zero and three, so here's my zero and three. All I need to do now is I need to find the primitive function, right? And again, it's the same function, so we can use our answer from the first part in the second part. Okay? So I anti-differentiated and I got x to the four over four minus two x cubed over three minus three x squared over two, right? And the first one I was taking between negative one and zero. 
and the second one between zero and three. Okay. And again, like I said, state this step here. Tell me what you're doing. What are you taking away? I want to see your end point and I want to see your start point, okay? In the correct order. It helps me to identify where you might be going wrong. And well, now you can see this can get very messy, right? You can see how long it starts getting. So it's very important that you don't try and squish things together. Leave it big, right? Use as many lines as you need. If you consider this question in the exam, you're not going to get 20 of these, you're going to get one, all right? So you're going to get given a lot of space to do it. So you use the space to your advantage, right? Right, after all those number crunching, right? I got this seven over 12 for my positive area. And I got this negative, it's actually a negative 11 and a quarter, right? But do you see how this minus sign that we put there changes that negative area for us into this positive area? Okay. And so we end up with 11 and 5, 6. Sara, is that was these some of the questions that you were getting negative areas or are they still coming? Um, no, this was actually one of the first ones that I got negative 11 and 5 over 6. You got negative 11 and 5, 6. Yeah, I got the same answer except it was negative. Okay. Um, how did you work out? Did you take your limits for the first part in the correct order? So when you were looking at the positive, did you take the limits correctly? Yes. You went from, you took zero, take away minus one, and then did you subtract mm. the next area? Yes. Yeah, I subtracted the, the three and then the zero from it. Okay. All right. Well, just compare your notes to mine. The, this is already up on it, Moda. So... Maybe just go and have a look later and just compare them and just see maybe sometimes you just accidentally drop a minus sign here or there. It gives you the wrong answer. Because do you see how in, in the initial calculation for the positive area, I actually got a negative. But it was a double negative. So just go and have a look and see. You might find you've just dropped a minus sign somewhere. Okay, right. Here's the next one. All right, I've drawn the graph there for you. Again, for the positive cubic graph, you have a top area that's positive and a bottom area that's negative. Okay, this time instead of subtracting the negative area, I'm going to switch the way that I take the limits. Okay, I'm going to swap them around instead of going n take away start, I'm going to take start take away n because that's automatically going to cause it to become negative and it'll be a double negative, so it will become positive. Okay. So I can say that the total area of the graph for this one is the integral of my function, and I've had to expand this out because I'm going to integrate just now. Right? Between negative one and one that's my positive part and instead of subtracting this time i'm just going to add it right here i'm just going to add this thing but do you see how i have swapped the boundaries okay so instead of going normally we would have the one at the bottom and the four at the top this time i've got four at the bottom and one at the top. And I'm using the rule that if I take the integral right from B to A, in other words, from star N to start, I will just get a negative version from or of A to B. Okay. And I'm just using that to my advantage because I know that double negative is going to cause my area below the graph to become positive. And you'll see how that works out in the calculations. Okay. So I've anti-differentiated, right? Here we go. There's my anti-differentiated function. And then I've told myself, what am I doing? I'm taking these between 1 and negative 1. 
And the other one, remember this time I switched them around, I'm taking it between one and four. Okay? And if you have a look at the result inside the two big brackets at the bottom, right? This gave me a positive area. And because of the way I did it, this also gave me a, a positive area. Here is that double negative that caused it to become positive, right? So just by switching the way that I did it, I could uh, create a positive area, okay? Now, which method you use, whether you use this method where you switch the A and the B to create a positive area, or where you rather just say, it's easier for me to just think, right, I'll take the areas above the x-axis and I'll subtract the areas below the x-axis, which method you use entirely up to you, okay? Whatever you feel more confident doing, that's the method that you use, okay? Alternatively, you can just look at these areas completely separate from each other, area of section A, area of section B, you know that all areas have to be positive, so when you get negative areas, you just make them positive and you just add them all together, okay? So any way that is the best for you. Right, let's quickly have a look at question six, okay? Question six, right, was different because instead of being bound by the x-axis, our shaded regions now bound by the y-axis, right? You see how there's no area touching the x-axis, right? And the easiest way to do questions like this is just to think, well, instead of differentiating in respect to x, I'll just differentiate in respect to y. Now, when you differentiate and integrate with respect to x, you have an equation y equal to something, okay? So if I'm going to differentiate or integrate with respect to y, I need an equation that says x equal to something. And if I have a look at my equation, it doesn't say x equal to something, it says y equal to something, right? So I need to change that first into something I can use, okay? So that's why we're going to manipulate the equation first, we're going to change the subject. We wanted x equal to something, okay? And that's just what I've done over here, right? I've squared both sides, I move the one to the other side and I've divided by two. Now, usually you would divide the, the side by two and you'd have a common denominator, but we know we're about to anti-differentiate. And so I've left these terms split, right? Because I know I'm about to use them to find the area, okay? Right, now when I'm finding the area, instead of taking the integral from A to B of F of X with respect to X, I'm gonna take the integral of F of Y with respect to y, with a tiny change in y this time. Okay, so I'm, I'm integrating with respect to y. Okay? But the process stays exactly the same. I still have my lower bound here and my upper bound there. So in other words, my lowest y value is 1 and my highest y value is 3. And so I'm still going to take the upper most value, take away the lower most value. And that would have given me 3. Right, question seven was exactly the same, right? The only difference here was that we had a slightly more complicated formula to work with, right? So when we changed the equation to x equal to something, you were given, you got this, okay? And we can't do anything with that, except we know what a square root is. It's just something to the power of a half. And so we could manipulate that into this. And we can, we can work with that. Okay. So I'll leave those up. Those are going to be, oh, well, they're already on Edmodo. All right, we'll quickly look at question 11. Now, it might have seemed quite daunting in the beginning to work out question 11, but it was actually quite easy, all right? It's used all the, all the calculus that you've learned now, you kind of brought it all together to try and help you work this point out, okay? So the first thing they said is find the coordinates of point P, okay? Point P happens to be on a straight line. If I know the equation for that straight line, I can find point P, all right? In order to find the equation for that line, I need two things. I need the gradient and I need a point. Now, fortunately, they've given us a point, right? And the only thing we need to find out now is the gradient. 
and well, we have an equation for that function. And how do we find gradient? We just take the derivative, right? So we had to differentiate that function. And we wanted the gradient at x equal to 2, because that's the point that we have on that line. Okay, That gave me a gradient of 4. In other words, you could say that m is equal to 4. From there, I just used that very famous formula that Dominic loves so much. Okay, y1 minus right y minus y1 equal to m x minus x1. I have the point 2, 12 that they gave me. I have the gradient 4 that I've worked out, and so I could get the equation for my straight line y equal to 4x plus 4. All right. So I have the equation for the straight line now. Point P on that straight line is just basically where the straight line cuts the x-axis. And where a straight line cuts the x-axis is where y is equal to 0. Okay, So I could just make my equation equal to 0, and I could solve that x is equal to minus 1. Right? And because it's on the x-axis, my y-coordinate is 0. That tells me point P is the point minus 1, 0. So I hope that you could have at least gotten that far, right, based on previous work. Okay. Right, now that I have that point P, I know all the lengths and distances, okay? And looking at this problem, it might have been like, oh, how am I going to solve this? Right, it's actually very easy, right? All you had to do was just split these into two areas, okay? So if you have a look, I split them into a triangle. And I split it into the other part that's underneath the rest of the curve, right? So in other words, if I want to find the total area for those two things, I need to find the area of both parts. I'm first going to find the area under the curve of x, 8x minus x squared between 2 and 8, right? I'm not interested in from 0 to 8. Between 0 and 2, that also just happens to be under the triangle. And I think that will be easier to do by itself, OK? So if I can just work out the area from 2 to 8, right? And if I add that to the area under the line from minus 1 to 2, I should be good. Okay. So here's where using your head can save you a lot of grief, OK? Here's the area under the curve, right? That's just the integral from 2 to 8 of the function. I can anti-differentiate it take it between 8 and 2, and I get 72. Now, you could have done the same thing for the straight line, where you took the integral between negative 1 and 2 of that straight line, except if you look at that area, that area is just a triangle, right? And whenever we're looking at area in terms of integration, if we don't need to integrate, then don't integrate, OK? I can see, I know how to work that area out. That, that's just a triangle. It has base 3 and height 12 from the information that I have, right? And using the formula that it's half base times height, I could have got 80. Okay. So the combined area was 90 units squared. The next question was pretty much exactly the same. You just needed to know where to split the two. I split it at point B. You can see I created a triangle on the right, and I have the area under the curve on the left. So I will leave my notes up. Well, like I said, they're already up for you guys to go through. Right, that brings us on to today's topic, OK? So we're now looking on page 260 in your textbook. It's actually quite a simple concept. So let's give this a go. But there's nothing, nothing really new that we need to learn. Okay? We're just going to use um, techniques that we've actually learned already. Right? And we're just going to use a clever little trick to help us here. So let's have a look at this diagram. It shows the curve of y equal to minus x squared plus 8x minus 5. 
and the line y equal to x plus 1. They intersect at the point 1, 2, and 6, 7. And they want us to find the area of the shaded region. Okay. Now, usually when we've been trying to find the area of the shaded region, okay, we have been finding it connected to the x-axis, right? So it was bound by the x-axis, except now the, the shaded region is not bound by the x-axis. It's between the curve and the line. Okay, so one way to think about this is what if I could work out the shaded area under the curve between one and six, and I could work out the area of the, well, that looks like a trapezium to me. If I take the area for the whole piece under the curve and I subtract the part that's for the trapezium, in other words, if I if I find this area here and I just subtract it, right, that will give me the area of the shaded region. Does that make sense? Would you agree with that? Okay. So what we can say here is that the area, right, the total area under or for this shaded region, okay, is just going to be equal to the integral from one to six of minus x squared plus eight x minus five with respect to x. Okay. And I'm going to take away the area for the trapezium. Now, who can remember what the formula for the area of a trapezium is? It's a half. Right? Remember, trapezium has got uh, its two parallel lines, right? So we take the top plus the bottom times the height. Okay. So in our example here, the top is this tiny piece over the top, and the bottom is that piece there, and the height is that. We're taking half of them because if you imagine joining those two pieces together, we have this shape here. And if I just add another one on top of it, I'll do that in a different color. That's why we're taking half, right? So we're basically saying, well, if I worked out what one whole one was, I just cut it in half and that's end up with. So let's just punch the numbers in. So I need to anti-differentiate first. So this is going to be minus x cubed on 3 plus 4x squared minus 5x and from 1 to 6 take away a half. The top is just, I believe it's two units plus seven units. That's I got from the y coordinates here. And the height is just five. That's just the distance between point one and point six. Right, after crunching all the numbers, okay, this gives you, we need to now take f of six, take away f of one. And I'm not going to bore you with the details. You can have a look in your textbook if you want for the number crunching. It ends up giving us 20 and 5 sixths units squared, okay? After we take these two away from each other, all right? Now that brings us to an interesting concept, all right? What if that area underneath was not a trapezium, right? What would we have had to do? Right? Well, we would have we would have done exactly the same thing, right? Except we would have just had to instead of finding the area as a trapezium, we would have taken the area as an integral, right? So I'm going to write this a little bit differently for now, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this up here to the top. So I've just taken these guys out of Desmos for us just to have a look at just to see what we're looking at. Right, I'm going to label these two equations. This is 
minus x squared plus 8x minus 5, and this is x plus 1. Right? Those are the two equations. Right? Now, I'm going to give these guys names. I'm going to call this guy f of x. And I'm going to call this guy g of x, just for now, all right? Just because I don't want to write what they actually are for a second. I kind of just want to give them their little tiny names first, OK? So the way we said we were going to work out this area is we were going to take the area for the guy, the big guy, and we were going to take away the area underneath that, OK? So we were going to take the area was going to be the integral from 1 to 6 of f of x. Okay. I just haven't written f of x equal. I could write there minus x squared plus 8x minus 5, but I'd like to show you what, what's going to happen here. Right? And we're going to take away, sorry, the integral from 1 to 6 of g of x with respect to x. Okay? That's what I'm going to do. Now, I wonder if any of you can remember back to the last lesson. We looked at this before, except we looked at this in the opposite idea. So I'm going to take you back to that lesson. Uh, it's this one here. Let me go and find it for you. Here we go. Here it is over here. This is what we basically have now. The integral from a to b of f of x plus or minus the integral from a to b of g of x, right? Except we learned before that that can actually just be written like this. We can just combine those two integrals, all right? So what we can say is sorry, that this is just the integral from 1 to 6 of f of x minus g of x with respect to x. So in other words, I'm just going to, if I want the area between the two, I'm just going to take the area for the two equations. I'm going to take the two equations. I'm going to take them away from each other, and then I'm going to add to differentiate. So let's replace these f of x and g of x's with some numbers now. So I'm going to use the integral from 1 to 6, right? So I'm going to write my function f of x, which is minus x squared plus 8x minus 5. And I'm going to take away g of x, which is just x plus 1 with respect to x. And we're only going to get one integral here. So instead of having to work these out separately, finding two integrals, right? If we are looking at an integral and both the integrals are being evaluated at exactly the same limits, we can just combine the functions and evaluate them together. And I'm going to give you a little tip on in which order we subtract the equations, because we could have subtracted these equations in different orders, right? And I'll show you in a second, which one goes first. Okay. So this just becomes the integral from 1 to 6 of, we're going to simplify what's in the bracket here. This is going to be minus x squared. This minus x is going to become plus 7x. And we're going to have minus 6 between with respect to x, right? And now I only have one thing to anti-differentiate, OK? So here I would just, again, minus x cubed over 3 plus 7x squared over 2 minus 6x between 1 and 6. And that would have given you exactly the same answer, 20 and 5 sixth units. Okay. So. I hope that hasn't hurt your brain too much. I'd like to have a look at this second worked example for you. All right. 
we've basically just established that instead of taking the area of the big one and looking at the area of the little one and subtracting the two, we can just look at these as a combined function. Okay. And so let's have a look at how we would tackle problem in 9.15. Okay. So I want to find the area between these two curves. Okay. So in other words, we learned that the area between two curves is just the integral Subtract the integral from a to b of g of x with respect to x. And this is exactly the same as the integral from a to b, sorry, f of x minus g of x with respect to x. Okay. So which one is f of x and which one is g of x? Right? That's the biggest question to ask yourself, right? And it's actually very simple. The line that is on the top is f of x, and the line that is on the bottom is g of x. That's that is as complicated as it is. That's it. Okay. So if you're wondering which equation goes in the front or the back first, f of x is whatever line happens to be at the top, and g of x happens to be whatever line is at the bottom. Okay. Right, we're gonna cut out in a minute. If you can just Join again. We've only got this work example to do and then we're, we're done. Okay, so I'll just keep going until we cut out and I'll just restart again. Okay, so let's have a look at this area. Instead of creating two separate integrals, we're just going to make a combined integral. You can see we want to go from one to seven, right? In other words, I want the integral from one to seven, right? And I don't want two separate functions, I want to combine them. So I want f of x, which is the top line. That happens to be 2x minus 9. That's my f of x. And I'm just going to take away the area for the bottom function, which is g of x. g of x is that bottom curve. And that's going to be x squared minus OK, so there we have our combined functions. So instead of separating these two, we just combine them together. All right, we have to do some tidying up here. Right, this minus x squared is just going to pop out minus x squared here. We're going to have 2x and minus 6x, except there's a, a negative there, so that's going to become positive. So we will end up with 2x plus 6x, which is just plus 8x. Then we have this minus 9 and a minus minus right again. So it's going to be minus 9 plus 2, which is going to give me minus 7. Okay. There we go. And this is all with respect to x. Okay. And now we're just going to do what we have been doing for the past days we're going to anti-differentiate to find the primitive right because we can't there's no ways that we can work that area out by any formula that we know right so we have to anti-differentiate so here we're going to get minus x cubed on three plus four x minus seven x squared between one and seven and we will take f of seven take away f of one And this is again where you just have to be very cautious, okay, because things can get messy. So we'll do this nice and slowly in big brackets, minus, now very important, this is minus, but that seven cubed is by itself in a bracket. Okay? So it's not minus seven cubed, it's minus, and in brackets, seven cubed over three plus four times seven squared minus seven times seven. That's just the start or the end, sorry. Take away f of one. So we're going to have 
minus one cubed over three plus four times one squared minus seven times one. Two, there we go. And I believe that gives us 36 units out the other side. So I know it's a little bit of an out there concept. We're kind of borrowing a, an idea that we learned a few lessons ago and just using it to our advantage. So I'm going to just pop your homework up here. So this is going to be exercise 9G, question two, question two, question four, B, seven, eight, and 10. And I'm going to do a short little video after this for you on question one, all right? Because we don't have any more time left. Um, and hopefully it'll help you with the homework, okay? So like I said, the most important thing when you're looking at these areas between two curves is just making sure you work out or you correctly put in which equation is f of x and which equation is g of x. And it's quite literally as simple as the line that's on the top is the f of x. It's the first equation and the line underneath is the g of x. Okay. So what I'll quickly do is I'll quickly just share uh, my other screen. Um, just so you can see some of the examples. Okay, so if we have a, if you look at exercise 9G, all right, and you look at question two, you can see the area falls between those two curves. The f of x is the line that is at the top, and that happens to be the straight line, y equal to 2x minus 3. The equation underneath is g of x, and that happens to be the parabola. Okay. If you have a look at question 3, okay, again, we have an area between two curves. This time, the curve is the equation at the top, and the straight line is the equation at the bottom. Right? And so the curve would be f of x, and the straight line would be GRS. Okay.